seems like with each day that the Lord honors me to handle his word, I seem to get a deeper and better understanding that the very things that most of the church world is running from, we need to run to. Peter is preparing these saints for the toughest ride of their life. And as I read this, it becomes a little bit painful for me because understanding has come through these words in this first epistle of Peter that indeed Peter did hear Jesus really well. Let me give you a perfect case in point. The text I'll be teaching from today is verses 6 and 7 out of the first chapter. He says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When I was reading this, and this was just yesterday, as a, a, the whole week's studies coming to a culmination, as I was reading this yesterday, some great illumination came to me. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the what we call the Beatitudes, the last of the Beatitudes. He tells his disciples, Blessed are you when men shall persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. And goes on to give them the comfort, for great is your reward in heaven. When these people do this to you, great is your reward. And my mind immediately raced from that to the close of John 21 where Jesus has restored Peter and tells him to love and feed or shepherd and feed his sheep and lambs. And indeed, the echo of the master's voice comes from the pen or the lip of the student right here, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Let me stop there, because there's so much to talk about in these small verses. It dawned on me that not only we know Peter was Mr. Pentecost and, and, and all the, the proclamation that uh, we read through the book of Acts, but in this reading, I find the student talking just like the Lord and Master taught him to, telling these to not be swayed now, this is not a call to stoicism, like uh, you shouldn't have these problems come into your life. But in fact, he addresses a paradox that if you'll just look at it for a minute, just in the English in plain view, the paradox is quite staggering. Paradox, in this case, will be two things occurring at the same time that appear perhaps to contradict one another, but they do not. In fact, they work together simultaneously He's saying, wherein you greatly rejoice, greatly rejoicing, and if need be, you are in heaviness. And they are simultaneously occurring. There is a paradox there. And forgive me for slowing down. If every child of God could learn this and take it to their heart today, we would quit complaining when the seasons come as they do when we are put into diverse things. Now, too many people are too apt to quote Romans 8 and say God enters into all things to work his good. That is true, but there's a greater, much more profound truth being said here, and I'm going to try and elaborate a little bit on it. See, I view the scriptures... I said to you a few weeks ago, I quoted a quote out of my, I think it's at the back of my Bible, the Bible's a rich quarry. That's right at the back of my Bible. The Bible is a place for us to dig and to dig a little bit deeper, even if we're rereading Scripture we've read our whole life. How many listened on Monday night when I taught on 
I am the bread of life. I'm not sure, for the ones that heard, I'm not sure that you heard what I meant. And I don't mean this to offend, I mean this as I'm not sure that anybody, I'm not even sure I understood what I said, for it was so profound, it went by so quickly. So let me go back there for a minute, because these words of Peter will not be of any help to us if we don't understand Jesus' words saying, I am the bread, I am that bread, I am the bread of life. And I'm going to use the term man, that is mankind, but let me use the term man. Until a man is hungry and knows that he's hungry, he cannot eat. And until a man knows that he's hungry and he must take and reach for that, appropriate it to himself and eat. And until a man takes and eats of that bread which Jesus spoke of himself, he can never be satiated. So what Christ does in our lives is brings us to the place of knowing that as much as we think we can fulfill ourselves in our own desires and quests, the only thing that can bring fulfillment is reaching and appropriating for that bread for which Jesus calls himself the true bread of life. That if you'll eat of that bread, you'll never hunger. Having said that, we're going to focus on this uh, whole passage here to at least describe the paradox. I'm going to use this concept, greatly rejoicing and are in heaviness to show exactly how we are and how we operate. You've heard me or Dr. Scott mention the Feather River Canyon. There used to be a train that used to run through the Feather River Canyon. It was one of those engineering feats. It was a small, I think, 2% grade all the way. And this staggering view goes through mountains and deep gullies. If we were to embark in that train, and make a journey, you would have a choice to sit on one, tr one side of the train or the other, but you'd be inside the train. If you were to sit on the side that lets you look down the gorge and out through the valley, you'd see the green trees, the meandering meadows, and the running water. If you sat on the other side of the train, you would surely be sitting in the shadows, looking out the window. You'd only be confronted with a lot of rock, solid rock. That's how we are. We are a dual-natured creature. We tend to focus on looking out the shadowed side at the rock, unable to look over in the same vessel, unable to look over at the green side of things, at the gully, the meandering meadows, and see this is in the same form. As the train will move forward eventually, so must I journey on. And I have the option, by the way, to sit and look at the shadows and the rock, or to look out and see the green of life. Too much of us spend our time looking through the shadows and the rocks, and not looking at the fact that maybe it's OK to sit in that shadowy place. Don't forget periodically to look over and see what God has done on the other side. There is light on the other side. So you can choose to sit in the heaviness of your circumstance <coughs> and revel in it. And I think that there are some Christians that, that, that they kind of like it there. You know, it's like, listen, I'm at the bottom of the barrel right now. No other stuff can hit my fan, so I'm cool. Leave me alone. <laughs> Little colloquialism never hurt anybody. But I would say we have to take the mindset now of why Peter is writing to these people. and what the motivation will be. You see, it's not enough for a pastor to say, it's OK, it'll be OK. It's not enough. Because each person has individual experiences. Today, as we speak, each person that's sitting in front of me, including yours truly, we each have things that we must deal with. And until those things are understood in a right light, you either feel like you're being subjected or it's unkind to you, rather than looking at it through God's perspective. I've heard so many people say this, why do bad things happen to good people? And I've never, I've never quite understood it as well as I do through the eyes of 1 Peter. There isn't anything that comes into our lives 
that God doesn't let. Even when Satan wanted to have access to Job, he still had to ask. It wasn't just some go and attack, and the hedge was lifted. There isn't anything that comes into our lives that God does not let for a purpose. If we will even fail to comprehend what the purpose is, but realize that in that moment, God is working something out. It's taking me almost five years to understand how God worked it out for me with Dr. Scott, that what I thought were the joys and the uh, blessings of my life, effectively what turned out was the joy and blessing of my life was living in the springs of his sorrow and of his sickness because it was there that I truly understood what the man of God was made of. The man of God is not made on the mountaintop. The man of God or the woman of God is made in the valley. And as he so aptly taught out of Psalm 84, blessed men go through. But until you see a man or a woman go through and say, the Lord has put me here, or some, some way God has opened up the hedge of protection and now I'm in this valley, and you start to watch the man or woman of God say, I am going through because God promised and I will make it through, and I will see the light on the other side. That watching can become a blessing and a source of encouragement for those who are not yet ready, not yet mature enough, not yet able to make such a trip. So God bless me with that. And I'm hoping today that at least out of Peter's teaching, we will have a new insight for the things going on in our lives today. Um, the other thing I was reminded of is while he's preparing these people for great tribulation, I'm sure they were tried from the outside and the persecution, and they were also deeply tried within. I want you to see how even these paradoxes that he speaks of right here, if we didn't understand them, we might say it's a lunatic writing, right? He's saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, we speaking good words to God, who hath, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again, being born again through death. I mean, think about that. There are so many paradoxes here to be gleaned from. A new inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. What from telling these people in the flesh right now, that they have something they cannot even yet touch. Another paradox. And yet another paradox, being kept in the power of God, being garrisoned. If I'll be just connected in faith, some dual happening simultaneously, which frankly cannot be explained more than that. And then greatly rejoice, and though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, through the Bible, we encounter these words of manifold temptation, temptations. In fact, if you remember, and some of you were around when I did this, I pulled this out. This was my handout from, um, gosh, I think it was June, you told me, June 2009 on temptation. I actually pulled this out of a, of a package of papers by mistake. My point is that I read it and I thought, you know, the Lord had really shown me something back then that the concepts of temptation, we don't even yet understand. And the different words that are used, in fact, this is why I wrote the Greek because I intend to at least break down the Greek for you today, the different words. When I taught on this back a year ago plus, I focused on pirasmos as my focus, teaching you about temptation, that was through the eyes of the world, the flesh, and the devil primarily. And I explained it, and I'll cover it again briefly what this means. But if we are to truly understand what is being said here, we know that temptations and trials are placed in our life for a reason. Now, silly me, I used to think that temptations and trials, and specifically, let's use the word temptations, were the things that are the obvious things that you'd think of if you were thinking temptation. But if you go back into the Old Testament and you read how that word is used in the Hebrew, you recognize 
that God was testing and proving and tempting his children to prove what was in their heart. You'll read that I said back there in this message when I taught it in 2009 that these concepts of tempting and trial are the Route 66 through the Bible. And I couldn't believe that I said that at the time I wasn't thinking 66, but it is the Route 66 through the Bible. Um, Peter will mention manifold temptations. So I want to talk to you today about what that looks like, lest we have an, an erroneous point of departure to, to determine what it means. And then from there, we'll build on why these temptations are necessary. Now, first, let's take this one word, because I can go back and rebuild the rest of this. Let's take this one word, which is being translated temptations. All right? And let's understand this one word in this light. In Genesis 22, when God tells Abraham to take his only begotten son, Isaac, and go and offer him up, it says right there at the beginning of Genesis 22 that God did this to prove, to see what was in Abraham's heart, whether he would be obedient to the words of God or no. And when he saw Abraham's obedience to listen to the voice of the sayer, at the time when he knew what was in his heart, he stayed his hand so that he would provide another sacrifice. God has a record through the Bible of doing this very thing. To the children of Israel, he says, now in their case, they needed some heavy-duty uh, help. But he says he brought them and led them to prove them, to see what was in their heart. Now, there, there are people that will say, but God doesn't ever tempt us to do evil because they, they quote James and no one understands the word study. So there's a tendency to cross the wires. This word for temptations is to see what good or evil is in a person's heart. It is merely to see, to test. Let's go to some um, metallurgist language, simply to test the metal, what's in there. And right, some of you smart ones have already connected the dots to 1 Peter 1, 7, knowing that that is where Peter will put his focus on the testing, like testing of metal. But here, the concept I want you to get today is that these diverse, these manifold, these various temptations, and you'll notice that in this particular verse 6 of 1 Peter, he does not specify what the temptations are, like it's some laundry list. He simply says these various, diverse, it's being translated manifold temptations. And so let me take the, the, just a minute to just make sure we're clear about this word temptations because this word here, dokimion, is the other word that's often translated to test, to try, trial, and sometimes to prove. And these two words get confused, but they have very distinct meanings. And for the Christian, this should help us to better understand why we have temptations, diverse temptations. You know, if a person is sick, if a person has grief, sorrow, whatever it is that is the plague of the soul, Satan is the expert to come and weigh down the soul even deeper by bringing you into a mindset that what is the obvious thing? You're not being helped. You're not being aided by God, so you sink a little bit lower. This heaviness can be used by Satan, but it can also be used, as I said, of God to see, will my children trust me? And God can use and does use diverse means to the word being translated temptation would be better to say a, a, a trying of, of the heart, like as in Abraham in Genesis 22. You can take the time to read that in your own devotions, but it goes straight through the Bible. In fact, in the Hebrew, there are a few different words 
that help us to understand when God was proving the hearts and reins, which is a popular theme right through the Psalms. He uses one word to test, to see what, it, what it's made out of. And he uses another word to put through, to refine into the fire. The reason why we end up with a fragmented understanding of when things come to us, the necessity of trials, why it is needful, becomes the undergirding of this passage. Let's go through this for a minute. So this strange word, which is greatly, to greatly, greatly rejoice. This is going to make you even more confused. Because normally, I know, I have, I'm good at confusing people. Normally, if you were reading joy, you would read the word in the Greek, karin. You would be reading that. But this word, agaliasti, is like jumping for joy. Woohoo! Yeah? It's like that much. It's like over the top. So you're, I know you're saying, come on now, in this, you greatly rejoice for a little arty. Now, not later, if necessary. We're going to use the King James if needs. If needs be, if necessary. And are in lupe fentes. This word is translated Sometimes grief, sometimes sorrow, sometimes, I mean, it has a negative and kind of depressive connotation to it. So, if needs be and are in grief, sorrow, in manifold, that is diverse, put manifold, keep the same language, manifold temptations, that, that, the, you're going to like this. This is the other word for testing. Dokimion. That the genuine, genuineness, which is probably a right translation, the closest we can get, of your faith, whom in this pisteos, which is going to be another interesting angle to kind of peel apart. Much more, polu, which is much more, and I want you to look at this, you'll remember this, Timothy, like Timothy, much more precious. That's what Timothy's name means. Much more precious, there is no than gold, it just says gold, of gold, literally, in the Greek, and so forth. Now, now that I've, I've put this out here like this, let me try and make sense for a reason. The temptations that come upon us, don't think temptations strictly like I listed in this handout. S Jesus was being tempted of Satan in the wilderness. Don't, if you only think in that dimension, you will miss the whole essence of what goes straight through the Bible. Yes, this word, pirasmos, sometimes carries with it God. God may be looking to see what's in the heart of man because God knows the heart. I don't. Satan may use this same concept to to get someone to try and do evil or think evil or whatever it is to lure people away. But then in this one word, I'm at least told by its diversity, by manifold temptations, that these also can be things that are put or placed upon me. And I'd say, I don't know why this is happening, Lord. I want you to think about this. How many places do you read in the Bible where it says we are the apple of his eye? We're the apple, supposedly. 
It doesn't say you're the lemon of his eye. It says you're the <laughs> apple of his eye. So if you're the apple of his eye, doesn't he know how to take care of you and watch over you? And he is our heavenly father, but he's also our heavenly mother, and he watches over his children like a mother watches her children on the playground with a careful, watchful eye to see that no harm and no danger. Therefore, when we say, I don't know why this is happening to me, the next time you're going to go down that road, stop for a minute and hold your tongue just for just a minute and ask yourself the question. No, don't ask it, say it. I'm the apple of his eye. Whatever God has let come into my universe, he's let it come for a reason. What he asks me to do is stand fast in the faith while this is happening and let him work out what it is that has come over me because with my faith being what it is, that's what gets his attention. I'm trusting him. Like Job, though he slay me, I'll trust him no matter what. See, we're really fast to get our tongue moving. I don't know why this is happening to me. You remember in the psalm, we studied a psalm, Psalm 42, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? That's David who had experience with God, and yet he uttered that. And I'm sure in the heavens, David would be saying, Well, I knew you were in control, God. I didn't, have, I didn't doubt it for a minute. The same psalmist in Psalm 69, I think it's in verse 1 when it says, the waters are coming over me like a soul drowning in melancholy. Could that be the same mouth that said, I will bless the Lord at all times? We think about this. Now either God is God and he's in control or he's not. And all the things that are coming into my life and yours, God is using for a reason. This is equipping it may be long and tedious sometimes, but I guarantee you if you'll ref reflect and pray on the things that I've spoken to you today, when you leave here, you may see some of your problems in a brand new light. Wow, you mean God is the master sculptor? You ever watch a sculpture being made where big, sometimes big hammers are used to chisel away at the big whack, 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 and you see a lot of stuff, big chunks fall on the floor. And sometimes it's the finesse of carving the little details. Well, God indeed is the sculptor, and sometimes he has to cut off big chunks at a time. And whether you like it or not, that is the process. And sometimes it's when a lot of the big chunks have been cut off, here comes the finesse, the detailed, finished work of the master's hands on you and on me. That's the process. There's no other way to get there. Now, whether you like the feeling of being carved on or not, you better like it a lot because it's the master's hand on you. It's not mine. He's the one saying, I need to, I need to fix this thing. <laughs> he started off with a big, giant piece of marble, and all he ended up with was It is finished. <laughs> That's what I said. All right, let's continue on here for a minute. Uh, let's go back to the text. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith now let's look at this. The trial of your faith, the testing, another concept of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. So here is the trying of your faith. This is the problem, that if we understand why God must not only test but refine. The testing process comes through the things put into our life. The process of being refined will bring out the genuineness. See, a lot of people think that, I have faith, therefore. And I've heard this passage mangled so badly, I'm going to make up a word today. God, get ready, folks. God is in the process of de-drossifying each and every one of us. Yes, I know I said it. De-drossifying each and every one of us by the things that he lets come into our life, giving us the opportunities of faith to rejoice, even though it may bring us 
into grief and sorrow for a time, that what is produced, the outcome of this, this temptation, this pirasmos, this to see what is in my heart, what comes out of that is the de-drossification, some part, not in total. It's not like a one-time event. Oh, I had all of this happened, now I'm, I'm de-drossified. <laughs> Continuously, God bless you. Continuously. And I'm going to read something here because I don't think I could say it any better I, I, in my own notes. Gold, is gold put in the fire to make gold? Is gold put in the fire to make gold? No. no. I'm not sure we all understood that, so we'll say it again. The answer is no. I'll help you out. Is, God, is gold put in the fire to make gold? No. Good. It was gold before. It went in. All right. Does the process of putting gold, that is, or dross into the fire, does it make it gold? No. All right. So, it is the afflictions of the soul, whatever our afflictions and conditions are, You'll understand why I had one of those illuminating moments while reading the scripture. I thought, you know, I think I've been going the wrong way. I've been trying to think, how, get me out of here. Fix this for me. I don't like this. This hurts. I don't like that. This is making me crazy. No, 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 no. This is how God's accomplishing his work in me. And just like you, Let's look at me, because I'm eyeballs are at, on me right now. God gave me diverse perasmos. He gave me the opportunity to see what was in my heart. Would I step up to the plate, even though I'm dwarfed a million times over by Dr. Scott's intellect, by his ability to articulate, by his genius, by his years of ministry? by all of these things, but would I, would I get out of my box and not say, well, I can't do it, but, but, but God can, to see what was in my heart. And the moment I stepped forward, I could have taken any other option, but to see what was in my heart, the moment I stepped forward, God started to honor my faith. Now, it doesn't mean that at the moment you step forward, you've arrived. It just means now starts the process. And these manifold temptations, whatever they may be, let's call them, so we're not being confused here, let's call these manifold trials because temptations has this connotation right now that if we go too far down that road, you might say, well, what were you tempted with? And I don't want to tell you that right now. <laughs> All right, so there's a possibility, you know, friends, that when we read this, we can change the way we think. Take today's problems, the problems you woke up with today. The body doesn't work as good, the bones are more sore, the mind's a little slower, the car isn't working, the wife is still complaining. <coughs> The neighbor's dogs were barking all night. Whatever it is, and I'm being silly, but find whatever it is for you and understand that in the big scheme of things, God gives us these situations to see. Now, I failed the test. If there was a test, I failed it at least a thousand or maybe a million times where God gave me an opportunity to rise to the challenge and instead the old nature kicked in. Not being honest with you, because I want I wanted to settle in with you. God gives us these opportunities. I was talking with uh, a man who uh, yeah, is quite respected, supposedly, in the Christian universe of Christianese. <laughs> and this goes back, oh, some time. And this person said something that I really thought was distasteful about Dr. Scott. And at the time they said it, I just kind of, I let it be. But you know, what I should have done, what I should have done, I should have told the person right then and there, it's just, let's just be plain about something. Your likes or dislikes do nothing to edify the body of Christ. 
and right now your likes or dislikes being voiced to me about a person who's deceased show your cowardice to not have had the courage to tell him that to I should have done that. That's a spiritual dress down that says quit gossiping and quit backbiting and quit spreading rumors about a dead person. Get real, get alive, right? Well, but instead I just elected to just kind of let it be because I thought, well, this person's too much in the, in the intellectual realm, n not, uh, mm. yeah, exactly. So to what avail? But Galatians 6, 1 says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and that means it can come up and seize him with great force or unexpectedly, unawares, restore such a one, that is mending of a net, in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of humility, considering yourself lest you also be tempted, there resides in each one of us the ability to become that monster. I had somebody this week tell me about people who are busy backbiting and devouring one another pretty much in my presence. Some, some are here and some are not present. And my, my reaction immediately is, can, can we grow up a little bit? Get your eyes off of your problem or the person you don't like and get your eyes on Christ. And about 50% of the issues that you're dealing with will start to fade away because they don't really matter in the big scheme of things anyway. <sighs> All right, suck in your breath now, right? <laughs> okay, I'm ready to share a few tidbits with you and then maybe we'll, we'll move on. You know why I tell you about translations and versions? How many people say, why do you read from the King James? And I would say, why do you read from da-da-da? And why do you read from... At least when I do King James, I'm also giving you corrections, translations, uh, an understanding of words. I could have camped out on any one of these words. I'm giving you an overview. But I wish to show you something. King James and the Greek point out something very clear that your other translations may not. This greatly rejoicing and this grief are happening at the same time. Now, if needs be, now if necessary, both are happening for a little while, and it's not determined what the little while is. A little while can be an hour, it can be a week, it can be a month, it can be a year, okay? And the diverse, we've now said trials, that you are, the genuineness of your faith might come forth. All right, I want to read you a few versions, English versions, because it's simultaneous happening. It's not saying you'll be happy Later on, it's saying two things occurring at the same time. You are two different things happening simultaneously. Let's read from my favorite translation. That was, that was sarcasm, friends. Uh, from my favorite translation called the Massage Bible, or oh, the Message Bible. I know how great this makes you feel. Even though you have even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation. <laughs> what you talking about aggravation? <laughs> Sorrow, grief, disaster, sickness, distress, despair. I don't think I'd refer to those as aggravation, although that could be a part of it. It carries a much more profound, deeper meaning. In the meantime, Wow, just, just put your hat on here, folks, for a minute. In the meantime, pure gold put in the fire comes out, comes out of it proved and pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's a wrap, folks. All right. It's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as an evidence of his victory. No, the problem with that is it, it, it lightens the load. See, for me, listen, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I walk through dark places. And if I'm not walking through them, I'm with somebody, usually. Believe me, whether it's in prayer for you, as I receive your prayers, whether I'm in a prison somewhere, whether I'm ministering somewhere else. And the reality is that every single creature calling on the name of Jesus Christ in relating to him is groaning within 
with pains. It's not always painful, but we're, we're put through things. That's the lot. That's part of the transformation. Want to be metamorphosed? Spend an hour just saying that you want what the Lord wants for you. Watch and see. New Living Translation. So truly be glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. See how they miss it, though? Let me read that again. So truly be glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. Even though it is necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. No, 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 no. The joy is not ahead. The joy is right now. This is what could be missed in a flash. While you are in the middle of suffering, while you are in the middle of your sorrows, you are also being told to rejoice. Great leaping, woohoo, joy. Ha, 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 ha. Not ha, 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 later. Ha, 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 now. <laughs> Glad we understood all of that. These trials are only to test your faith to show that it is strong and pure. Hey, wait a minute. Who said that my faith was pure? Because with each trial, with each testing, with each situation, for that one thing that I went through, what comes out is the genuineness of my faith. It doesn't say anything about how, how pure my faith is going to be because, listen, that means by that necessity, if God fixed a problem or my faith was pure, proved genuine, I've got and now a whole new day ahead of me to start going backwards and doing it all over again. It's, it's just rhetoric. It's nonsensical. So, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, and your faith is far more precious to God uh, than mere gold. Well, I would hope so. So, if your faith remains strong after being tried by fiery trials, it will bring you much praise, glory, and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Do I have to wait that long? I thought if I'm in his presence, he, he'll surely enter in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Do I have to wait for the whole world? Listen, you can wait on the world. I'm not waiting on the world. When he calls me, I want to go. You can wait if you want. Catch the next bus next year. If he comes t today, I want, take me. I want to go. I don't want to be here. All right. See, you just get a little, little idea that I'm, I'm, I'm impatient with all this. But here's another one for you. This is the New Century Version. This makes you very happy. Even though now for a short time different kinds of troubles may make you sad, these troubles come to prove that your faith is pure. This purity of faith is worth more than gold, which, which can be proved to be pure by fire, but will ruin. But the purity of your faith will bring you praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is shown to you. Well, the only thing I like that they did is they said they made it to me individually for each person, which I believe, for each person. And last but not least, the contemporary English version. On that day you will be glad. On that day you will be glad, not, not any day soon. So just don't, don't even think about being glad until that day over there. <laughs> Nos comprendemos on that day over there. Not today, not next week, on that day. Whatever that day is, that day over there. On that day, you will be glad. Even if you have to go through many hard trials for a while, you mean to tell me i got to wait until that day to be glad, even though I have to go through stuff right now? Your faith will be like gold that has been tested in a fire, and these trials will prove that your faith is worth much more than gold that cannot be destroyed, or that can be destroyed. They will show that you will be given praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ returns. So, all of these is the reason why we do the translations, because most of them miss this one thing. It is the diametrically opposed problem, the paradox. It is this Contrary wise, what goes on in our nature, it is something that must be addressed and seen as what God does when we are faithing and trusting Him. Now, let's take a few things at a time. The trials, if needs be, first, number one, if needed. Why do you suppose that Peter uses this if needs be, if it's necessary? If it's necessary, 
I mean, surely, isn't there somebody that's good enough to be so good that it, it, it doesn't needs be? The answer is no. See, once we, we cross this hurdle of understanding that it's not just that somebody has bad luck or, oh, well, just deal with it and be stoic. No, 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 wait a minute. God is letting me have an opportunity. You know, I've been asking you for weeks, please pray for this person, they're sick. Please pray for that. That's our opportunity to reach and amen God at his word for the whole body. But I can guarantee you every single person here has something that they would like God to do for them individually. And sometimes we want to go for the thing we want done. We want the result of the doing without the process of getting there. And sometimes the process of getting there is through these diverse, manifold trials. When you read, I have a whole bunch of scriptures that I wrote out here. When you read all the different places in the Bible, um, for example, there's one place here. I, I even took out a Proverbs. Can you imagine that? Proverbs 17.3, the refining pot is for silver, the furnace for gold, the Lord trieth the hearts. Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Uh, uh. You're not going to tell me something better than that? Yes. Jeremiah 9, 7, Behold, I will melt them and try them. Yes, Lord, melt me, please. <laughs> Zechariah 13, 9, And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. I will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and so forth. Even right into Malachi. These are concepts through the Bible. The fruit, excuse me, the fruit of the trial is what comes forth. The necessity of it is it must be. It's inevitable. But the fruit that comes forth, read it in the last verse of the King James where it says that it must be, uh, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory. You've got real metallurgist words being used here. The testing of what's in you, and when what's in you, when God sees your heart, he takes that what's in you, and into the furnace you go. Well, I don't like that. Well, that's the way it works. Remember Romans 5? How many remember wacky, the wacky Christians? Wacky Christians? Everybody needs to hear about wacky Christians getting more whacked. That's Romans 5. Until you become like jerky. <laughs> Let me think about that for a minute. Because there are some people that are like jerky, but it's old and chewy and not a good example, I think. Well, well, we'll go back to this one. It's better. Greatly rejoicing for a season. Your King James reads for a season. I've said for a little while. The, the necessity for a season. And just like the man going through the valley of weeping, it does not say how long the season will be. We read the psalmist weeping by night, but joy comes in the morning. You know what? I don't know how long the night is. I'm not talking about a 12-hour, 8-hour period. Some people are in darkness as we speak right now and have no light. Isaiah 50, who walketh with the Lord, who fear the Lord, all of these concepts should fire up a newfound direction to say, wait a minute, what's going on in my life right now? God is entering in and using that to see what is in my heart. Melissa Scott, what is inside this container and what comes forth will be the genuineness. That's not for me to inspect or for you to inspect. We're not mutually inspecting each other, okay? That's God's business. That's why the relevance of last week, faith by hearing the word of God, because without the ears hearing God's word and being filled with only that, I'm sorry, no, nothing else has the power to save. You can tell me anything you want to go for, self-help, self-denial, self-groupism, or whatever it is, there is nothing that has the power to mend, to restore, and to save other than the power that is found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else.
the sooner you come to that conclusion that this, the bread we've just eaten today, will nourish you and give you strength to make it through. Another week is coming. Your week may start the minute you go out that door. And you're going to find something. These words, hopefully, will resonate. The trial of your faith, not what somebody else wants you to be, the trial of your faith, where you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through hearing his word, much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried. Again, that same word is being duplicated. Though it be tried, the same word, same cognate. Though it be put through the fire. Yeah, I'm curious, and I, I know the answer. I can smile because I know the answer. Anybody here been through the fire just a little bit? Good, then I'm not alone. You know what gives me comfort? The fact that I've gone through the fire and I will continue to go through the fire. I'm his child. You're his child. You're his children. You know, when you go back and read the passage out of Hebrews where it says, without chastening, if the Lord doesn't chasten, it's not his child. Read that today with the eyeballs focusing on this and say, wait a minute. I may have things happening in my life, but I am the apple of his eye. He's letting these things happen to prove, to see what is in my heart. He doesn't tempt me to do evil things, but he tries the heart and the reins to see, what will you do next? Are your circumstances so bleak? Are you reduced down to just barely even, you can't even fathom where either your money or your health or your family or whatever it is that you're just hanging on to? These are the things, the trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, the genuineness. It's a lot to speak when the mouth is going, yes, these are good words that are being spoken in the name of Jesus. Where do you place your body? Is it following the mouth? I rest my case. Nobody, nobody objected. The point I'm saying here is it becomes very obvious to me if we understand the necessity for the saint, it is inescapable. It shouldn't be like, oh, get me out of here. It should be, God loves me enough to chasten me. Think of that. Somebody said, well, do you think that of sickness too? I think that of anything. Because supposedly, supposedly, whatever comes on this frame, listen, I've been hated more than I can, I, I've been hated by so many people and still hated by people. And it only, it only focuses my mind to one place, the Lord loves me. I've had things happen in this church, and I think, how could, how could, how could? No, it can. Because maybe God's trying to point something out that I don't see with the flesh eyes, but with the eyes of the Spirit through faith, it becomes clear. Whatever your perasmos is, whatever your trial is, no one thing, he's looking for faith that will go through, it will be tried. By the way, if I could hang a sign right above heaven's door, there is no flesh beyond this point, and the key to admission through that door is the tried faith. It is the tried faith. It is the fathers. Go read Hebrews 11. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. So Peter is echoing this. In the big scheme of things, he is getting these folks ready for something pretty terrible by telling them, no matter what comes your way, rejoice. Think about the Apostle Paul. Not, you know, I thought for a time, maybe they're far off, but they're not. The Apostle Paul's writing, he uses the same paradox. Though he was poor, became rich, sorrowful, but always rejoicing, unknown or well-known, yet unknown. These, these d dual personas of, of what goes on inside of us is exactly what's happening here. Don't run from it. Don't resent it. Don't say, God, if you just get me out of this, well, believe me, he will. But it'll be his way. If, if in the process of getting you through, he has reached in, here it comes again, and de you just a little bit, 
and he's de-drossified me just a little bit, that's a little bit less dross. I don't know what the degree is. It could be invisible. I don't see it. But a little less than I was carrying around the last time. I pray you remember this because there's only one concept in here that should be hammered home. God did not promise you won't have any problems. God did not promise you won't be tempted. God did not make any of those promises that the rest of the church world is telling you that's normal Christianity. Normal Christianity is saints that will go through and they will persevere and they will be persecuted and they will be tried and they will have every lot probably dumped on them. But in the process, what comes through as gold, more precious than gold, and while everybody's clamoring to figure out the most precious commodity you can have, oh, I watch the market and watch things go up and go down, and I think to myself, what's the most precious commodity we could have? Believe me, gold will go the same way and all the other things that are around. And by the way, whether they go up or they go down, the one thing that will not change in God's sight, you could have all the gold, you could have all the silver. The one thing he cares about the most is your faith that has been tried in the furnace of life, the afflictions of the soul that bring forth the gold in his eyes. That when you said, and I said, no matter what happens, I will stay on his word like Job, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. And stay fixed on that word. And like Peter preparing these people, that your faith might be found unto praise, honor, and glory. Not unto a lot of money, or unto a lot of bling, or unto a lot of things. Praise, honor, and glory. If time permitted, we'd, t we'd pull apart the praise, honor, and glory, but I think it's self-explanatory. It's what God will look at on the day when we stand. Not if you were a good, righteous doer, an actor, and beer, an impersonator. Did you faith in him? Did you trust him? Did you hang your whole being, no matter what, how hot the furnace got? The Lord is with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I will trust him. I am trusting him. He is with me. He has promised to never leave me nor forsake me, no matter how hot, no matter how tough. The Lord is there. And the Lord, my friends, today is here with us. So for those who are uh, going through trials, cheer up. Not because it's going to get worse, but because there'll be more. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.